Hey everybody, this is Father Warner. Now I have been teaching you um, the texts from the prophet Hosea and I've been trying to follow up as close as I can with the texts that are uh, at daily mass taken for the first reading. But I find myself unable to do so because as I said, we have been jumping texts this week itself. We began with Hosea chapter 2 and by Saturday we will have completed Hosea in chapter 14. Uh, it was a little possible to do this with uh, Amos, it was uh, a shorter book. But I can see as I looked at the lectionary next week or rather from Saturday we begin with the prophet Amos, uh, sorry with the prophet Isaiah and it's going to be impossible to do the whole of Isaiah in a week even though the, um, the aim of um, those who put the lectionary together was to give you a sense of what is going on in uh, prophetic literature. Uh, now, what I plan to do is to simply continue with the prophet Hosea till its uh, logical ending. So I'm going to do two chapters today, but maybe do a chapter every day from now on. And next week, uh, begin with the prophet Micah because uh, in the lectionary, we will take Hosea, then Isaiah, then Micah. So I will drop Isaiah because there's no way I'm going to be able to do all the chapters. It's the longest of prophetic works. Uh, and I'll start with Micah so I prepare you for the weeks to come. And I will try to cover one or two chapters. But in this way, I will be able to do a verse by verse study with you. Now for those of you who would like to get previous teachings on the first reading, uh, I send via WhatsApp um, a daily uh, message which has the links of the first reading and the gospel in its text form. I could also add uh, the um, what you call um, uh, video forms if you'd like. So in the comments section, uh, or rather let me give you my number and then I will redirect you to another number. So you can send me a message on 98202-42151 and I will give you instructions on what you need to do next. That's 98202-42151. For now I want to go to Isaiah chapter 7 and 8 and both, sorry, Hosea chapter 7 and 8 and both of them are extremely lengthy. So. Let's begin, Hosea, I'm going to begin with the end of chapter 6. When I would restore the fortunes of my people, chapter 7 verse 1, when I would heal Israel, the corruption of Ephraim is revealed and the wicked deeds of Samaria, for they deal falsely. Now, who these they are, it seems, as we're going to read this text, uh, refers to people in Israel who in a way are political traitors. They butter up the king, they will wine and dine with the king only to betray the nation. But they do this, they wine and dine with the king so that when there is a calamity they will not be singled out as traitors. So God is speaking to their wickedness their deeds that they do and that is why the reference now is the deeds that they do in Samaria because Samaria is the political capital. Otherwise the prophet Hosea always speaks of Bethel or one of the shrines. So let me read that again so you get the nuance of it. When I would heal Israel the corruption of Ephraim is revealed and the wicked deeds of Samaria. So these are their political doings. For they deal falsely. Now, the thief breaks in and the bandits raid out. So, this is an indication of these people who are not loyal to the nation. Yeah, They break in they break out, and bandits break out. But they do not consider that I remember all their wickedness. So, God basically says he sees and he remembers. God both sees our sins and God remembers. I've said this again when we did the prophet Amos. Many people think, 
oh god cannot remember you know when i was growing up we had this concept of you know god when we die will open that big fat book and he will read out our sins but i can see where that thought comes from it comes from the old testament that god sees and god remembers you know uh, you may have a secret that is secret to men but there is no secret that is secret to god and ironically god says i will remember all their wickedness and i say ironically because when you look at the prophet jeremiah in chapter 31 verse 34 god said i will forgive their iniquities and i will remember their sin no more but in hosea god says i will remember i see and i remember now their deeds surround them and they are before my face so god is saying do not think that your sins are wiped away they are always before my face even the psalmist has says have mercy on me god before you you alone have i sinned my sin is ever before me so each one of us in the depths of our hearts know the sins that we have committed my sin is ever before me and our sins are ever before the face of the lord now verse 3 to 7 really deals with the political situation that is going on in the northern kingdom now you'd remember that from the superscription in uh, in in hosea chapter 1 verse 1 we were told that jeroboam the uh, second was the king but what we also know that in 25 years after the death of jeroboam from the year 746 to the year 721 bc israel will see six kings uh, from five dynasties and why do i say five dynasties because you killed one king and killed all his relatives uh, only for somebody else to take his place not necessarily somebody from the bloodline but somebody from another family so you had six kings fi- from five dynasties succeeding one another many of them lasting just a brief period of time but most of them being assassinated so you can see that why the nation uh, um, enjoyed political peace in terms of no attacks from uh, the neighboring nations and while the northern kingdom we learned this also from amos was economically stable there was a lot of upheaval going on in the palace now um let's carry on with the text so verse 3 to 7 is what we are looking at by their wickedness they make the king glad so they as i said they pretend to be good uh, but they are not loyal subjects of the nation they are accused really of treachery and the officials by their treachery they are all adulterers why because they are two timing the nation they seem to have favorites we'll see this you see among Uh, the political class of the northern kingdom there were some who were aligned to egypt in terms of let's make alliances with egypt and there were some who were aligned with assyria and said let's make alliances with assyria so really their heart was not with their nation their heart was obviously their paymasters from these other nations who were pushing their and driving their own agenda and that's why god says they are all adulterers they are like a heated oven whose baker does not need to stir the fire they are ready yeah they are just ready okay ready from the kneading of the dough until it's leavened they are over enthusiastic in a way to betray their very own nation verse 5 on the day of our king the officials became sick with the with the head with the heat of wine so this is where we know for sure that hosea was a prophet from the northern kingdom ministering to the northern kingdom because he refers to the day of our king so once again these wicked people as god calls them with their wicked deeds are the ones who as it were butter up the king they are there with him eating and drinking and they even become sick from drinking were six for they are kindled like an oven their hearts burn within them all night their anger smolders in the morning it blazes like a flaming fire now you know you must remember that israel was weak 
not because they didn't have the military strength. Israel was weak because they chose not to keep God's laws. They strayed away from Yahweh. They could have surely picked on a fight with their neighbors and even won. And they have done this in the past. But here are people now who have strayed away from God. And when you stray away from God, well, everything is up for compromise. And that is why they are willing to, in a way, literally lustfully, you know, uh, in their hearts. And lustfully, I don't mean only sexually, but with that lust that they have for power and for the lust for their idols. Verse 7. All of them. So you can see. Uh, the reference is not only to some, it is, uh, it's the entire nation that is now moving in this direction. All of them are hot as an oven and they devour their rulers. So really they are out to betray the rulers. And as I said, when you have in 25 years, six uh, kings being assassinated, you can see the lust that they have for power. All their kings have fallen. Look at chapter 7, verse 7. None of them call upon me. So it could mean that both the kings never called upon Yahweh. And we know this because all the 19 kings of the northern kingdom worshipped fertility gods. So none of them called me, as in the kings never called me and the people also never called upon God. Now we come to verses 8 to 12 of chapter 7. And uh, once again, as I said, there were divided loyalties. Some of the people of the northern kingdom wanted to work in favor or work with or make alliances with Assyria in the north and some of them with Egypt in the south. Now, this whole concept of making alliances with other nations was very myopic. It's very short-sighted because you would get some benefit in the short term but you would never find peace in the long term. Lasting peace was going to elude the people of the northern kingdom and finally they are going to be taken into exile. So let's look at those verses. Ephraim mixes himself with the people. Ephraim, as I told you, is another name for Israel. Ephraim was the largest of the northern kingdom tribes. So Ephraim mixes itself with both Egypt and Ephraim mixes itself with Assyria. Ephraim is a cake not turned. So God is saying you are half baked. You are like a raw pancake or like a raw cake. You know, you're cooked only on one side, but you think you are well done. No, you are not well done. You are like a, um, like a half baked pancake. Verse 9, foreigners devour his strength. So therefore, others take advantage of you, the neighboring nations. But you, Ephraim, you do not know it. Grey hairs are sprinkled upon him, but he does not know it. So, you know, sin destroys the soul and we don't know it because sin, you think you're fine from the outside, but sin is destroying you from the inside and you don't know the amount of destruction that is being done. Also, there's a reference here to grey hairs are sprinkled upon him. So, either that they're, they're living in denial, that they pretend that they're still young, or, uh, you know, grey hairs are coming upon them and they look at grey hair as a sign of wisdom, but it's really a sign of folly. So they do not know it. And what is the reason why? And you see in verse 10, Israel's pride. It is their pride, their inability to acknowledge God. They think that they are the source of their wisdom, of their power of their knowledge of which God told them, you have none. You have knowledge about other things, but remember God said, you have no knowledge about my law. And many of us are in that category. We know about everything, but ask many Catholics about knowledge of God's law, and they know very little, even less about God's scripture. So Israel's pride, verse 10, testifies now against them. Yet they do not return. They should have returned to God. They do not return to the Lord their God. They do not seek him for all of this. You know, I'm thinking of the prophet Jeremiah in chapter uh, 17, verse 9. He says, the heart is deceitful above all other things. Yeah, sometimes our own pride, um, our own ego, 
makes us think that we are invincible. Ephraim verse 11. Ephraim has become like a dove and God gives now another analogy. This is a dove uh, that's fluttering around um, silly and without any sense. This dove is being chased by an eagle that's going to attack it and the dove thinks oh I escaped the eagle and God says they call upon Egypt and they go to Assyria. Egypt and Assyria are like that eagle so they go for protection to the worst of the people. They go to protection also from those who are going to devour them. Also verse 12 as they go and as they go says God I will cast my net over them. They are not going to escape my punishment. This is the fowler's net. I will throw it over them and I will catch them. I will bring them down like birds of the air. I will discipline them according to the report made to their assembly. Verse 13. Now, uh, in verse 13 onwards, you're going to see why God is angry. God is going to give you a list of his complaints. He'll say they strayed from me, they rebelled against me, they speak lies against me, they did not cry to me, they rebelled against me, they plot evil against me and you'll see this all from verse 13 to 15. God is going to bring a whole lot of charges against, um, against the nation of Israel. Now, so basically what you're going to see now is the theme of ingratitude and the theme of treachery. They have become a treacherous people, enough to rebel against God, enough to speak lies against God. So treachery and ingratitude. So let's go through them. Verse 13 of chapter 7. Woe to them, for they have strayed from me. The first charge is brought against them. They have strayed from me. Destruction to them, for they have rebelled against me. I would redeem them. I would have helped them. I would have strengthened them, I would have rescued them, but they speak lies against me. And you see this today, so many lies are being told in the name of God. Yeah, And God is being made to sound today like his word is a bunch of lies. Verse 14, they do not cry to me. This is something that we all do when we need God, but now we have become so proud that we think that our professions, our homes, our jobs, our, this is what ha we have. Many people say this, I have worked hard, true, but this is all mine. This is not yours. This is the grace of God. And we need to also turn to God in our weakness and we need to cry to him. So they do not cry to me from the heart. Yeah, They're just pretending that they come to me and, you know, that they are sorrowful for their sins. They do not cry to me from their heart, but they wail upon their on the beds on their beds. So they don't want to see their own problem, or rather, they see their problems, yeah, that they are facing, and they wail about it, but they are not willing to see their own sin. Yeah, we cry to God when we have problems. We don't cry to God and tell Him we have sins. Yeah, but we'll tell him all our problems. So they do not cry to me from the heart, but they will wail upon their beds. They, they gash themselves for grain and wine. They rebel against me. Verse 15. It was I who trained and strengthened their arms. So God says, you think you won victories in battle? You did not win vic victories in battle. It was I who trained and strengthened their arms, yet they plotted against me. Verse 16, they turn to that which does not profit. Yeah, how interesting. All our lives, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? Verse 16 says, they turn to that which does not profit. They have become like a defective bow. What does a defective bow do? It is broken. And so even if you shoot from it, it's going to miss the mark. Yeah, it's going to go in the wrong direction. Israel went in the wrong direction. God says, you have become a defective bow. Their officials shall fall by the sword because of the rage of their tongue. 
so much for their babbling in the land of Egypt. So all the words that they said in Egypt, yeah, wanting to be rescued, well, so much for it. You never wanted to be rescued. You just wanted to do what you wanted to do. So with that, we come to the end of chapter 7 and I will do another recording at the end of today and I will teach you chapter 8, which is extremely long. It has another 14 verses. We just did 16 verses in chapter 7 and even though I'm just rushing through it, it takes about 20 minutes. So somewhere later on uh, in another three or four hours, I will upload the next video, which will be Hosea chapter 8. Bye for now, everybody. Don't forget to like this video and share it with your friends. And if you haven't, subscribe to this channel. See you.